On the 6th of October 1976, leftist and pro-democracy protesters, workers and students who had occupied the Thammastat University were subject to a brutal assault by the Thai police and various right-wing paramilitary groups. The protesters were campaigning against the return of the previously ousted military dictator, Field Marshal Tanum Kitty Kachon, but they also attracted the anger of pro-monarchy groups. The demonstrations soon descended into a massacre, carried out by the police and right-wing paramilitary groups with dozens killed and many more subjected to sadistic assaults. In today's video, we will cover the Thammastat University massacre, what caused the event, and just what fate befell those campaigning against military rule. It is perhaps helpful to start with the rule of the man the demonstrators were protesting against, Field Marshal Tarnum Kitikachon. He had been part of the Thai military coup in 1957. In 1963, he succeeded the previous military ruler, Sarit Tanarat becoming the Prime Minister whilst appointing himself head of all military forces. His rule was noted for his support of the American forces during the Vietnam War, offering the use of Thai air bases for American bombing campaigns. He was staunchly anti-communist and was beset by the Chinese-trained guerrilla forces throughout his rule. His rule was also noted for the high levels of corruption and nepotism, with both his son and father-in-law effectively running the country alongside him. In 1971, he ousted his own government to further cement the military rule over the country. But in 1973, student-led demonstrations would topple the military regime. For many in Thailand, in particular those of the middle class or those who had been exposed to the more democratic states, there was a fear that the growing power of the military would rob them of any real future. Students made calls for the reinstitution of the constitution. It soon became violent as clashes between the police and the students intensified. This was not, however, limited to just the students, as at its peak, the crowds protesting the authoritarian and royalist rule numbered around 400,000 strong. On the 14th of October 1973, more than a hundred protesters were murdered by state forces. These murders seemed to pull support from Kitty Kachon, notably from his military leadership who refused to escalate the violence any further. His government collapsed and Kitty Kachon was forced to flee Thailand. However, this was followed by weak governments with few willing to rock the boat and favouring conservative policies, and kowtowing to the military leadership. As communist forces succeeded in the rest of Indochina, there was an increased call for the return of the anti-communist Kitty Kachon. This, however, was met in turn with student and pro-democracy demonstrations against any potential return of the field marshal. On the 24th of December 1976, two labour activists were caught posting anti kitikachon posters. The pair were badly beaten, murdered and hung on a set of gates for all to see. It soon became clear that those responsible for the lynchings were none other than the local police officers. It was believed that the purpose of the field marshal's return was to encourage a military or right-wing takeover, and that it would embolden the various right-wing paramilitary groups to commit acts of political violence. As the students and labour groups protested and demanded that the government bar Kitty Kuchon's entry into the country, right-wing groups did indeed unify to defeat what they saw as undue communist influence decreeing in a joint statement that they would do what they could to prevent any further left-wing interference. Kitty Kachon arrived in Thailand in October of 1976, dressed in monk's robes, promising he had no interest in politics. On the 4th of October, demonstrations at the Thammasat University included a stage production of the lynching of the two labour activists. The student playing the role of one of the victims apparently bore a striking resemblance to the Crown Prince of Thailand. The press soon published photographs of the event, framing it as an anti-monarchist production and as proof there was a communist plot to overthrow the crown. It is important to note that the main goal of the protests included attempts to prevent another military takeover of the country. The student and labour movement supported better rights for workers, peasants and the poor. 
They largely opposed the growth of military bases and the role the military played in the government. This, however, was not made clear, and instead the emphasis was on the slight against the royal family. This only added to the turmoil affecting Thailand, and resulted in a huge polarisation of the population. There were only two acceptable factions. The socialist-leaning left wing represented by the labour and student movements, and the conservative and royalist right wing who feared communist takeover. Upon seeing the images of the play apparently depicting the crown prince being lynched, there was an effort to mobilise patriots to the cause against the demonstrators. Military controlled radio stations bled out news framing the demonstrators as communists and anti-monarchy, and called for the mobilisation of thousands of members of right-wing groups, such as the Red Gauze, the Village Scouts, and the Nawafan Organisation. Membership of these groups ranged from former soldiers, government functionaries, and pro-monarchy individuals. Many of them rallied to the call, and joining the Thai police besieged the Thammasat University campus. It is also believed that a number of ununiformed police officers were amongst the crowd that had gathered, to help encourage the violence to come. In the early morning of the 6th of October, the violence began in earnest, as the Red Gauze and other paramilitary groups attempted to break onto the campus. At around 5.30am, the police began their assault. All manner of military hardware was employed against the protesters. Machine guns, grenade launchers, and even anti-tank weapons all brought to bear. On the nearby Chow Freya River, three heavily armoured patrol boats were stationed. Grenades were fired into the university, instantly killing at least four of the protesters. This was followed by a hail of bullets sprayed in every which direction. It was claimed that the students had shot first, though there is little evidence to suggest that this is true. In the face of such an onslaught, a number of the student leaders offered themselves up to the authorities, in a bid to negotiate an end to the violence. They were all, however, promptly arrested. Attempts to move out the wounded were all ignored. All exits were blocked off, with those attempting to escape via the river coming under fire from the patrol boats. At around 7am, the main gate to the university was breached, when a hijacked bus crashed through, driven by the Red Gauze. The police and the paramilitary groups began to storm the grounds. A free fire order was issued as police took over building after building. Following the police through the breach were a number of right-wing paramilitaries, cheering in their support of the unfolding bloodshed and deaths of the students. Whilst some students attempted to fight back, according to those neutral parties to their chaos, it was a very one-sided firefight. Grenades were thrown into buildings and through shattered windows, all in effort to clear out and round up the protesters. At one point in the chaos, a Red Gore car bomb exploded sooner than intended, injuring nearby police officers. Once the police had control over the university, thousands of students were stripped and made to lie on the floor, hands held behind their heads. Guarding them were the very police officers responsible for the deaths of dozens of their fellow students. Milling around the captives were the paramilitaries, who would kick and beat the detained students. But a far worse fate befell those who attempted to flee the police through the main gate. Many of the paramilitaries who did not follow the police through the breach were able to capture the fleeing students. What would follow would be an exercise in extreme sadism. The level of violence employed is best perhaps encapsulated in a Pulitzer winning photograph, taken by Neil Yulovic. After witnessing the police shoot their way through the grounds of the university, Yulovic left through the battered gate and witnessed a group of paramilitaries surrounding a corpse swinging from a tree. The fact that the lynched victim was already dead did not stop the crowd from venting their fury. Yulovic managed to capture the moment just before one of the paramilitaries brought a folding chair down onto the lifeless head of a student. All the while, a crowd watches. Amongst the crowd are a number of children and many smiling faces. This particular image is too gruesome for YouTube, but if you wish to see it, a link will be in the description. Those students who attempted to flee through the main gate had to contend with a host of aggressors. 
Many who fled was subjected to all manner of assault, and was carried out in clear view of the police officers. Many of the corpses of those lynched by the enraged crowds had their bodies mutilated, with some of the women having their breasts and sexual organs mutilated. In one instance, a wooden stake was driven into the chest of one of the victims. In another instance, the red gauze poured kerosene over the corpses of three people, and the fourth who was barely still alive. In total, it is thought that 45 students died, with hundreds more wounded, though some believe the deaths were more than double. For the police, two were killed, and two dozen or so wounded. The role of the military radio in instigating the violence cannot be understated. They exaggerated and pushed the rumour that the students were heavily armed, and preparing for an all-out communist revolution. It was claimed that the students had grenades, heavy machine guns and all manner of military hardware. Whilst there were some armed students, there is no evidence that such heavy weapons were hidden inside the university. All that the police could provide as proof of weapon hoarding was a pair of rifles. Yet, it was still framed as a successful suppression of a communist plot. By the afternoon of the 6th of October, the Thai military staged its coup, pointing to the chaos of the events at Thammasat University. The new Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces, Admiral Sangad Chalaru, declared the state forces had spared Thailand from a Vietnamese-backed communist takeover. A royalist government was installed, washing away the pro-democracy gains of the 1973 coup. As for Kitika Chon, the man whose suspected arrival sparked the protests that led to the massacre, he kept his pledge to stay out of politics, though soon abandoned his monkhood. To this date, no person has ever been charged for the murders that took place at the Thammasat University. Whilst there is a memorial at the university, there is little in the way of education on just what happened on the 6th of October 1976. Even when it is discussed, it is simply referred to as the 6th of October event. Whilst there was no doubt a level of political strife, the events that led to the Thammasat University massacre can be seen as follows. The Thai police allowed a number of right-wing paramilitaries to provoke a delicate situation around a lawful student gathering. Military radio stations and pro-royalist media outlets spread misinformation, inflaming the situation further. The police's attack with its sustained machine gun fire and explosives resulted in the deaths of dozens, with many more injured. What's more, the police did nothing to prevent the mob engaging in sadistic assaults or the lynching of students. At a time where extreme polarisation divided the population, it was only a matter of time. The levels of hate that were cultivated against the students and the unfounded fear of an impending communist takeover were the justifications for levels of sadism only found where there is extreme dehumanisation. It is vital that we look to such events as to the consequences of such hatred and the dangers of getowing to militant forces.